The President's Message, Boston, April 1, 1909 The Mutual Welfare and Brotherhood of Musical Students Dear Brothers, This is the text from the first page of Symphonia writ for four little Symphonia sermons. Although the sermonizer, I take my seat right in the midst of the Symphonia audience and listen to the message. The thought that I should like to drive home so that it will sink deep into the hearts of all the brothers is that of personal responsibility. Without this sense, there can be no mutual welfare, no brotherhood of any class of men. Wrapped about the idea is all that Symphonia ever was, is today, and ever will be. Our very genesis was not really a beginning after all, but indeed the product of a personality, Father Mills. In all its growth, our fraternity has been nurtured by loving hearts and counseled by wise heads. Men have felt a personal responsibility. If its future is to be one that shall command admiration, a sense of personal responsibility must be its ever-constant attendant and guide. By this, I mean a profound realization of duty on the part of each one of something beyond mere self. I mean one's self-projected, an ego that consciously reaches out after God the Father and touches man the brother. For a man's personal responsibility never stops with himself. It has a threefold significance and embraces himself, his brother, and his God. The Symphonia is what each man is, no less, no more. Its dimensions are the size of the Symphonian. Its height is your ideal, its breadth, your intelligence, its depth, your feeling, its weight, your work. If you have a high ideal, a broad intelligence, and deep feeling, and you do much work for Symphonia, you will understand full well what personal responsibility means. Let us print in big type the dimensions of a true Symphonian. Ideal, intelligence, feeling, work. Ideal. First, brothers, get a high conception of life itself. Take account of what an individuality means, not arrogance and self-conceit, but honesty and self-respect. Now, think of an ideal, then speak out about it, and next work for it. Let it be as practical as a high ideal can be. What? How do you like the sound of the best men among musicians, or the best musicians among men? No, the best men among men. That is a splendid ideal, is it not? Such men must possess stability. You yourself should seek it for yourself. Do you know it oft times is the accumulation of a series of other virtues? The gentler ones, such as sincerity, sympathy, and sacrifice. Remember these virtues when you speak of the ideal sincerity, sympathy, sacrifice. Is there any higher type of man than found in that happy combination of a good, great man and a great, good man? Do you not recognize the elements of sincerity, sympathy, sacrifice, and stability in such a one? It is destined for few to do great deeds, but it is meant for all to be good men. Remember the true words of a wise man who wrote, It is not what those around us do for us that counts, it is what they are to us. Improve, if you can, on even this ideal of good and great, so that you will get to think on the highest plane and move along righteous lines. Try it. It gives a fellow a boost to personal responsibility. Intelligence. An ideal to be worthy must be born of intelligence and feeling. It must take into consideration the mutual welfare of all. It must not be selfish. It should study men before it attempts to shape men. It should sympathize with men before it seeks to summon men. Symphonia spells brains as well as heart. It does not say that every man shall admire everything and everybody who is a Symphonian. This would smack of insincerity. It means something on the level, practical and helpful. For in Symphonia it is designed that every man should study everything in everybody in order that he may know him better that he may recognize his virtues by praising and trying to emulate him and discern his weakness and shortcomings by sympathizing with and trying to help him. If intelligence demands both honest praise and heartfelt sympathy for one's fellows in Symphonia, it also calls, and in a loud voice, 
for fairness. Fairness in judgment and action, but especially so in judgment, for if that be fair, the act to follow will be right. If the historian had told me to write a message of but one paragraph, it would have been this. Meet the fellows halfway. Intelligence calls for fairness. The idea, the spirit of conciliation, is the most beautiful revelation of the divine in man's intellect that I can think of. Listen to the other fellow. Do not browbeat him. Do not ridicule him. Do not ignore him. Show the fair spirit. Give up every little whim or prejudice of yours up to that point where the surrender would carry with it the very vitals of a great principle. Prune off the trivials, the caprices, the prejudices on your argumentative tree. Be reasonable, and you will win the other man. Can you find anything in that marvelous mind of Abraham Lincoln standing out more striking than his fairness to all, with malice towards none, with charity for all, with fairness in the right? As God gives us to see the right, let us strive on. See how concisely and eloquently Lincoln puts it. His were the words of a victor of victories and a master of masteries. A worthy model, a fine example for Symphonians, for all men. When one speaks of a Symphonian, he means a man, a fellow musician, you. Whereas before you may have lived isolated in your work, in your pleasures and pains, your conquests and defeats, your hopes and despairs, now you have company. The force of the idea of brotherhood has made itself felt upon you. Has it? Have you got in its way? Do you meet the other fellow halfway? Among honest, intelligent men, this halfway business is a great meeting place, for it has all the sweetness of the lover's tryst and all the surety of the soldier's rendezvous. It is pretty safe ground. One may come from the east and the other from the west of the broad field of opinions, shaking their fists at each other, and when they start off again, lo, they go arm in arm marching due south. Fairness warms men up. Try it. It gives a fellow a boost to personal responsibility. Feeling I have said that an ideal to be worthy must be born of intelligence and feeling. The greatest thing in the world is love. May we not think of it as God's own feeling in man? If every Symphonian felt it, what a brotherhood would be ours. Do you love your fraternity? What does this mean? Love for fraternity may sound abstract, but it is nothing of the kind. It means love for men. It means love for one man plus one man plus one man plus one man and so on until you have covered all your fraternal obligations to every other man. A desire and a strife to meet these is proof of your personal responsibility in your fraternity. Some men ask, how shall I get the fraternity spirit? Learn to love men. Every man thinks more of himself in the end if he thinks more of his fellow men in the beginning. This is the right procedure in order to have the right kind of fraternity. Some men, it is true, have the peculiar knack or the blessed power to show more loving kindness, more fraternal spirit than others. But if this love for the mutual welfare and brotherhood of musical students be alive in your heart, it will be seen in the glow on your face, felt in the warmth of your hand clasp, and heard in the ring of your voice. Have you sown your heart with seeds of love? Try it. It gives a fellow a boost to personal responsibility. Work. Intelligence that possesses the ideal and the feeling of love that sustains it must produce good works. Its visible expression must be seen in works for Phi Mu Alpha principles. The continued and permanent success of our fraternity depends upon us all, but all is made up of units. Speak aloud this word, unit and shout the first syllable. It is this part of the word that I want to emphasize. No one can do all the work, but you can do some of it. If you do not do something for your frat, it is because you have no capacity for work and no love for men, and it may be you lack both. If such be the case, I suggest that you dwell for a moment or two on the second syllable of our little word, unit. 
Oftentimes, the reason for failure to work for something or somebody is not because people think too much of themselves, but because they forget to think of others. They remember to be personal, but forget the responsibility which is a part of the whole. If a chapter does not get along well, it is because some man in it is sick, peevish, or out of gear. It may be you. It may be I. Speak aloud these last four words. Do it now and then take a look inside. Is the Symphonia machinery at work? With regularity. Look sharp, for the smallest piece of mechanism out of order in a great machine will do a lot of damage. It may smash the whole engine, hurt other things and blowing up and even kill the owner. If you are not working for Symphonia, it is because you do not love your brothers. Do not say you cannot, but right here go back to the little sermon on fairness. Your attitude impoverishes the Sinfonia. You become a pauper in your fraternity, taking everything and giving nothing. Such a man is like seaweed on a ship's hull and retards her progress over the seas. In order to get along yourself, you simply cling to what is doing its best to move ahead. Sooner or later, such a man will be scraped off. Now then, let every brother find his work in Sinfonia and set out to do it. If a good thing has been started, put your shoulder to the wheel and push. Think of what has never been done and what would be good to do, and try to find a way to do it. Now turn back to the little sermon on ideal. Avoid growing sleepy, indifferent, careless, and spiteful. You have a personal responsibility in this matter. Unless you do what this demands to build up Sinfonia, at least one of our great aims will never be accomplished by Sinfonians, the advancement of music in America. No one save a man working with high ideals, broad intelligence, and love can hope to reach this end. His musicianship alone will not avail him. I might name many very different things in one's apprenticeship in Sinfonia for his life work that would be good for him to do. I think I will. Attend all meetings and be prompt about it. Read the bylaws and the Constitution and see that you live up to them. Officers, enforce them. Study the ritual and master it. Let every man do quick and complete work on his committees. Speak in meetings. Don't talk. Answer letters immediately. Keep promises. Think up new ideas. Tell about them and work them out. Most of all, fellows, show a willing spirit for work and enter into it with zest. Let us tune ourselves up to the highest key of brotherhood and so make a veritable symphony orchestra of the minds and hearts of America's musicians and her lovers of music, and then shall we drown this old world's sharps and flats. Go back to the little sermon on love. The Sinfonia will grow, my brothers, as you grow because the Sinfonia is you. The word is of eight letters. The spirit is of you which can never be spelled out except in life itself. The mutual welfare and brotherhood of musical students will decline and die if you are selfish, careless, and indifferent. Sinfonia will become not something, but somebody, as you grow into a living, loving force in the great big world. Try it. It gives a fellow a boost to personal responsibility. More than ever is it good to be a Sinfonian, for once a Sinfonian, always a Sinfonian. Fraternally yours in Phi Mu Alpha, Percy Jewett Burrell. From the Yearbook, Symphonia Fraternity of America, Volume 8, 1910-1920.